Game Awards predictions? Just because we're sick of talking about Bethesda. Hello and welcome to Triangle Squared, a PlayStation podcast. I'm your host, Brett Beck, and alongside me, your good friend of 87 episodes, Mr. Saw Bridges, bringing you the luckiest of them all, 87. Why are you laughing? 88. Why'd you do that to me? <laughs> I have it pulled up over here. I, like, literally, it's in reader mail, or it's in the the keep. I did it because last episode you said, you know what? We're going to change it on here, and that way we won't mess up next week. I just wanted to see if I can mess you up. You did. And, and I, I also got to rib on you for missing an episode one the, time. The so funny thing is is that we just tested mics, and I said 88. I know. That's so what, that's what I worse. had it right the first time, but... Tell them why we're here. If I sounded like I was on a cell phone last week, uh, that should be remedied, but let us know. Um, anyway, we are Triangle Squared, a PlayStation podcast. Uh, we come to you every Monday at 10 a.m. PST and 12 p.m. CST in video format on YouTube. If you like what we're doing there, subscribe to us. Hit the little bell notification so it gives you every Monday bare minimum uh, an update on what we have coming out. And then, of course, sometimes when we do our bonus stuff, like the reader mail that will be coming, uh, Friday after you watch or listen to this episode. If you want to respond to us and what we talk about in the show, you can do so in the comments below. We love to hear y'all's thoughts. And if you want to listen to us in audio only format, you can do so on Android or Apple. We're using Google Play Music, Google Podcasts. Uh, we are on iTunes if you use that. Of course, we're on Spotify these days. You know, we me. fought for a long time just for them to make it where it's easy for everybody to get on. Uh, but you know what? That's okay. We are there now. Uh, we like to add in now, and I'm trying to keep it up with it. If you are new to the show and you know we do our little teaser before the intro hits about what the main topic is going to be, uh, before we get to the main topic, we do come in, talk about what we've been playing, kind of ease into the podcast, do some news, do the games releases for the week, and then hit some reader mail before we go into that reader or into that final topic. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, we do add timestamps so that you can go to the topics that interest you most. That way uh, you get the most out of your time and for your enjoyment. But with that said, you can also find us on social media on Twitter at Triangle SQRD on Facebook in a group Triangle Squared, a PlayStation podcast. You can find over there. Uh, ask to be accepted and we will gladly accept you in. That's where we ask both of those places or where we ask our reader mail questions for our reader mail segment. Uh, and of course, you can support us on Patreon uh, over at patreon.com slash Nartech Gaming, N-A-R-T-E-C-H Gaming. Uh, that's where you can support this show and anything else that we decide to do moving forward with it and lastly if you want to join the ever-growing continuous discussion you can find our discord which is in the uh, description through all of these things so with that said saw what's been doing this week been playing a lot of destiny 2 i have a new answer which is nice so, yeah you do i was gonna say destiny 2 and let's go e or pikachu not eevee let's go pikachu uh i started my hunter uh get back again on destiny 2 so i i Leveled him up to 50, and now I'm working to get to 600. But that's pretty much it. I know what you've been playing, though. I mean, you know one. I, I technically mentioned the other one, but I don't think it was in your mind of what it was. Uh, but I, I'm back to being a uh, an addict. So, of course, I Oh, yeah, beat, RuneScape. Yeah, I beat Red Dead. Uh, and now I have Darksiders 3, which has been great to me so far. And I think it's one of those things where, you know, I mentioned on Twitter, it's one of those games where despite the softer reviews going into it, uh, the game has met my expectations and actually even exceeded them. Uh, I knew going into it, this is the first game in a long time, the first game in the series in six years, first time under this new publisher uh, with it being a new game. Of course, it's got a modest budget. They kind of got to see how things are going. It was a new engine they had to build from the ground up. There was a lot of things where I was like, you got to keep in mind what's going on here. If you know what you're going into and you know that every one of these games in the series already plays differently than the last already, because that's just something they like to do. Have a series that feels familiar because of the visual aspect and the lore aspect, but then every game plays decidedly different from the previous one. Um, then I, I came into this one and I actually, you know, the only apprehension I had at first was that going out of all these first person games, because I played Red Dead first person, um, playing in a third person with a character that felt a little bit clunky at first was like, okay, she doesn't feel great when she's moving, but she feels great in combat. Then I noticed that if you sprinted, uh, that you move really well. And I love that because 
my only, I guess, complaint that I'd say about that part of the movement system is I just wish that her sprint speed was just essentially her normal speed. Uh, but I guess I do like that they give you the ability to have a slower thing, depending on if you need to be a little more precise with your movements. But what I was telling Kiki last night, too, for people who are interested in it, that is not me saying anything bad about the game in that sense because that's actually like a mechanical thing. The double jump feels a little limited, but that's because later in the game you get these items called hollows, and with those hollows you are able to... And they all change. There's four of them, and you get them throughout the game one at a time, and they change the way that your jump works. So it makes sense they did it that way because it's mechanically reinforced later through different things that they're trying to do. But I've been greatly enjoying it, and it's uh, Dark Souls influences very much to like I did with Vampire earlier this year, where it just feels like a good, not entirely Dark Souls based, but I like the idea of the of Dark Souls and like the way they do world design where it's like there's a lot of hidden elements and hidden bosses and things you can do where you're like oh i just found this little nook that maybe you know the 50 other people that played this didn't find but maybe they did maybe yeah. they're all exploring as much as i am but it's like a weird way to increase your play time without doing something that just it's all up to you do you want to explore you're going to increase your own game time because of it yeah and I, so, I like the dark Souls series so much because of stuff like that the hidden boss battles and the kind of off the wall hidden corners they have throughout the game yeah and i think the other thing i was mentioning is like dark uh, dark siders as a series has never just beaten you over the head with story uh but the way like and they came into this and saying that this one's not going to be story heavy but none of them have ever ever really truly been story heavy uh but I think what I like about the Dark Souls game style and why so many people look to that for inspiration and it's coming back is that it makes sure that gameplay is the part that is the best thing about the game first. And it means that even if the game ends up having a lackluster story like Lords of the Fallen, it doesn't really matter because Lords of the Fallen played well to me. Yeah, It was a fun game. And I'm having that same experience with Darksiders, though there have been a couple of uh, moments in the story, despite it not being just a grand story. It's more like an introduction to Fury uh, and to the events that were... One thing I like that Darksiders does, as a quick side to make that make sense, is that all of the games take place roughly at the same time, but they're all like different sides of the same story. So like, you had Wars events in the first game, uh, and I'm not going to spoil any of them, but you have Wars events in the first game, then there's a long period in the first game uh, that you don't play, but it just happens, and then you come back. Um, Death Story is involved with that specifically, and he is going through at the same time while War is going through his stuff, and then Fury's also doing this at the same time. So if they make a fourth game, Strife will have that same situation, which I really like that idea. of Getting to see the same story from four different sides, and they're entirely all different, I like that idea. Detroit did that really well. Yeah, yeah, that too. And that was more of a moment to moment where it's moving on its own throughout the same game. But I like dedicating a whole game. Uh, I think, you know, one thing I miss from Darksiders 2 is the uh, ability to go through different dimensions and have wildly different visual aspects because of the dimensions. They do what they can to help change Earth up more so than they did in the first game, which is also, you know, almost, I think, 10 years old at this point. Wasn't Death the main character of Darksiders 2? Yes. Okay. And then War was the first one. Yeah. So in that sense, I mean, they all felt different, but I'm loving this game in, in spite of its flaws, and it has them, uh, but they're not so abundant that they take away from my moment-to-moment -moment fun. And well, that's good. enough for me, you know? Uh, but, of course, I've been playing RuneScape, mobile old-school RuneScape, which is just a nostalgic. I love it. Ugh, I tell people all the time, it's, it's a game that has had me addicted a number of times, and here I am again playing and trying to fight myself from paying for membership on the game it's on your phone it's not a game uh well you know the thing is is it plays i you know people say this sometimes about some games and i actually do tend to agree sometimes that there are games that i think generally almost work better as phone games because of the way that the menus and stuff are made runescape was literally just point and click everything that makes so much more sense for a touch screen so it actually feels phenomenal. Yeah, but there's no such thing as games on phones. So, <laughs> Well, does it help that it's technically... I feel like I should clarify that I am incredibly joking. Oh, I know you are. I know. I just want to make sure everybody else knows before they all get mad. But RuneScape's great, and I've been loving that. And, of course, I've been playing Destiny. Uh, and our friends of the show, thankfully, Kiki Vince, and I think Liam, picked. Uh, he grabbed the PS Plus version of Destiny 2 for free, so he'll at least be able to play some of the base game. And maybe, wink, wink, hint, hint, we can convince him to just spend money on the... <laughs> DLC, it's worth it. I promise. You get three DLCs for the price of the one. 
But we'll see if you like the game first. Anyway, with that said, Saul, do you have anything else you want to mention before we hop over into the drop? No, I think that's it for me. Well, <clears throat> nope. And, okay, fine. <laughs> for those that don't know, the drop is this week's PlayStation releases across all of its platforms. So first up on the list, we have Arcus Path VR for none other than PlayStation VR. We have Astrology and Horoscope Premium for PS4. Oh, man, that sounds like a quality game. Yeah, it does. We have Adelire Miru Miru. Uh, the Apprentice of Arkland or Arlan DX. We have Adelaide Rorona, the Alchemist of Arlan for uh, or DX, and we have Adelaide Adelaide. Now I'm getting everything mixed up. Adelaide Totori, the Adventurer of Arlan DX, all for PS4. Do you feel that's like essentially Pokemon Blue, Red, and Yellow? Possibly. <laughs> like it's all the same game, but you just play as a different character, and you buy the game to play as that specific character. I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know anything about those games. I'm not though. big into the Adelier or whatever franchise. Uh, Adelier. I don't know how you Adelier. Do yeah. Battle Princess Madeline for PS4. Oh, my laptop did something weird. Betty's Bat Treasure Hunt for PS4. Emerald Shores for PS Vita. Energy Cycle Edge for PS4 and PS Vita. Escape Game Aloha for PS4. Did it again. Uh, Gnome's Garden: A New Home for PS4. Guns and Stories Bulletproof VR for PlayStation VR. Hello Neighbor Hide and Seek for PS4. Why do I keep doing that? Just Cause 4 for PS4. The Last Remnant for PS4. Life of Pixel for PS4 and PS Vita. Monica Ia... Okay, Enrique, Kiki, I'm going to need your help on this one. Uh, Guarda dos Colejos for PS4. Co Coelhos? <laughs> Something. <laughs> Kiki, uh, you obviously don't speak Spanish. Just move along. I don't speak we'll, Spanish. We'll say it's okay. Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom for PS4. Yeah, I'll make sure that was for PS4. Mutant Year Zero: Road <laughs> to Eden for PS4. Now you're second guessing your English. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just making sure I had to scroll. Like I had to scroll up. Override: Mech City Brawl for PS4. Persona 3: Dancing in Moonlight for PS4 with a VR mode included and PS Vita. Persona 5: Dancing in Starlight. For PS4 with a VR mode included and PS Vita. Persona Dancing Endless Night Bundle for PS4 with a VR mode included. Picture Party VR for PS4. PS VR. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds PUBG for PS4. Prison Boss VR for PS VR. Subnautica finally coming out for PS4. Highly recommend that game. Thronebreaker The Witcher Tales for PS4. And that is it for the list. You were clipping a little bit there, sir, so keep that in mind ah, as we move forward. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. In our Brett, ever in, never-ending quest to make sure our audio doesn't sound like dirt, I feel like we've done more damage in the past few weeks. Yeah, we have. But we are going to move into news now. And so just so you know when you're talking, you can always look at the bar. I know. I know. I'm still clipping. Y'all know the back the back workings of the show these days. Uh, first thing first, though, Gran Turismo Sport has an update coming December 5th that's adding seven new cars, a new track, and more. So if you are interested in that game, check that out. I've been really impressed with the amount of updates they've done to this game and how long they've kept it. And it really, I'm wondering how long they're going to continue to support it and if it'll continue being supported while they work on Gran Turismo 7 or if they're going to try and keep moving forward with this kind of eSport backing. Uh, in their games it's moving weird forward. weird to me to see the eSport backing. I don't know. I mean, I think it makes sense because it's essentially the closest thing that we've seen Sony really do to a game as a service. Um, yeah. Out, outside of those free-to-play games that they were trying real heavily to do with uh, Killstrain and uh, Drawn to Death, which moved away from that, thankfully. Uh, and then there was another one that, did it ever even come out? I can't remember what it was called. But regardless, they had that yeah. little stint where they were trying to do that. So that was interesting. Uh, Monster Hunter World, for people who are still interested in that game, uh, has its Winter Star Fest going on from now. It actually started, I think, the 29th uh, until December 17th. So if you want to participate in that, uh, log in. It adds new gear, new dances, new food. We totally both played Monster Hunter World this week. Oh, we way. did, and we and didn't we mention forgot. it. Yeah. yeah. New and returning quests slash events. So if you've missed out on any of the crossover stuff, uh, you can go and go grab them. And changes obviously to the appearance of the gathering hub and outpost of the game to look all Christmassy. And, uh, they gave Mr. Piggy and I can't remember what their actual names are called. Um, but my pig, he gets new outfits and he can look like a little elf and it's very cute. Uh, why can I not remember his name? Bacon. Ba bacon. <laughs> what? I'm just trying to remember cause it's not a straight up pig in monster hunter world. I don't know why I can't remember the name. Poogie. Poogie. Thank you. There you go. 
Poogie Google is our is our overlord. So thankfully for them, we don't ever have to be behind on information. Next up, THQ Nordic. So Dark Side of Three publisher in this case, the company that bought and absorbed a large majority of the late THQ proper have recently spoken about their more than 100 IP they own. Currently, they have 55 games in development, which has been known for some time, uh, with them saying that 35 of them have not yet been announced. In regards to the future of these new and previous IP they have acquired, CEO for the company has said that fans should not expect sequels to all of their IPs. He stated irrelevance as a main reason for some older IP that they hold uh, as to why they won't be necessarily seen anytime soon, which leads you to wonder why did they buy them to begin with was it just easier to lump some buy some of them and that's why it was just like ah we'll get it it'll be something that we have that has some kind of value but the value is not worth trying to bring a viable product to market yeah that's a lot of ips to have a hundred is a lot but when you think about thq and what they already had and the kind of the, the way that they'll do that one double a game that just doesn't stick and they own the ip but they'll never make another one and that just kind of happens that way uh i think that there's you a know, lot of those from THQ. I, yeah, and I think the obvious answer, though, when you think about a lot of these things, is which ones are most likely to get uh, sequels? Obviously, we know that Darksiders got a sequel, uh, and I would imagine that it's going to be loosely dependent on how well this one sells as to whether it gets another one, though I do think that what we already saw was that Darksiders 3 was dependent on how well the other two sold, uh, and... THQ Nordic were very interested in making sure, if possible, uh, that the original team from Vigil, which are now mostly at Gunfire Games, were able to work on the game. So I think it was kind of a mix of that, which leads me to believe that the two uh, remastered versions that they did sold well enough to justify three. So I don't think it's necessarily in the realm of impossibility uh, that we would have no chance at a four. And I think it'd be a shame, even from what I'm learning a little bit of, of in this story, um, but of a possibility of a continuation. Yeah. You know, and it's nothing just major, but uh, one thing happened that I will talk to you about when we're off camera. So don't ruin it for anybody who's actually curious. I know you don't really care. That's why I'll just kind of tell you, but it was dope. Um, anyway, that's interesting to me. I just think it's, that's very likely what it was. I imagine when you're doing some kind of a, you know, massive sale, definitely when you're doing something like THQ's liquidation, that it was easier for THQ Nordic to come in with one lump sum and just go, Hey, we want to buy everything that's left over, including the rights to the THQ name. And apparently, it was cool. There was an interview with Gunfire Games where they were they were talking to them about Darksiders 3. They were like, hey, do y'all want to use the Vigil Games name? And so apparently, they own the rights to that name. And technically, Gunfire could have switched over to being Vigil Games again, but they decided against it. And I think that was probably a smart idea. There's probably like bad yeah. juju attached to the name at that point. Certainly so. It's kind of like the old rule. What is it that uh, if you, you don't buy wedding rings from the pawn shop because they were most likely from failed, failed weddings yeah <laughs> or failed marriages uh do me a favor quick before you on the next one uh yes. give me a kleenex and i'm gonna go hop off camera and blow my nose it's like i'm, I'm dying over here look saw being so nice and friendly i will continue on with this though for the time being and let's see the astro c40 dash tr ps4 controller that acts as an elite controller uh, for people who have seen the xbox elite um controller has been given a solid release date we knew it was going to be early 2019 but they are calling it march 25th 2019 and it's going to be staying at its previously announced 199 price tag so if that's interesting to you or if you are a professional gamer like my boy Saul over here and want to spend loads of money on controllers uh go for it he says he'll do it again. I bet you he will. I won't be surprised if I go over to his house and see it. Uh, Just Cause 4, which was on the drop, if you are interested, the file size has been revealed. So if you're planning on grabbing it, you'll need 43.57 gigabytes free on your system. Keep that in mind. That's not that crazy for that game, honestly, considering how much is supposed to be going on in it. Um, but that's you know, good. It's better than to be a double. Well, I mean, I guess better. Better than taking three hours to install like Red Dead did. Eh. Uh, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, the long-awaited Castlevania spiritual successor, has announced that developer WayForward has joined development in a support role, ironing out bugs and generally speeding up development. The game still has no release date, but hopefully this edition will help uh, get the game out to a release point sooner rather than later as it's been... Man, it was originally supposed to come out, I think, March of 2017. This goes to show you how much a game can get pushed back. Yeah, and I'm glad it's not near full price either. Yeah, I think that that like game 20, was... like 20 I think. Yeah, I or think... Or is it 9 
I don't think it's nine ninety nine. I think nine ninety nine was what the uh, blood stained. I can't remember the name of it right now, but the Curse of the Moon and then yes, um, that yeah, they, Curse that of the they Moon did. and Bloodlines. That one was nine. That was was nine ninety nine. If I'm not mistaken, I think this one's twenty. Ritual of the Night, if I recall. Yeah, Ritual oh. of the Night. Uh, but that's one of those things that I think it's a decently priced game. It's just it's an example of Kickstarter. Normally, a game like this, you know, if it was. If it was going under development, they wouldn't have shown it, and they wouldn't have not. They wouldn't have shown it until they felt like they already had a release date shown. But when you're doing things like Kickstarter, and you're supposed to be very intimate with the fans and the people who back them up, you kind of are led to the point where you have to, to an extent, give dates that you may not be able to hit because every barrier is gone to an extent. You know what yeah. I mean? Like from the get go, you're already trying to aim. Like just as an example, uh, pray for the gods, uh, which is the uh, Shadow of the Colossus spiritual successor that a small team is doing, and I think I've showed it to you, and it looks really great. I backed uh, it. I have the beta um, on my computer right now, um, and I need to play it because uh, I backed it at full price. Because I was like, why not? At this point, I could just get it on Steam for twenty bucks, but I want to play it on PS4, and I will just give them sixty dollars because that's what our fifty. I can't remember which one it was. Um, but anyway, when they initially did that campaign, they had a kind of a, a, a schedule of what they intended to have done at certain points and then a release date. And they've luckily been able to stay relatively on schedule. Um, but I think Bloodstain's just... also probably falling a little bit victim to seeing things like uh, like Mighty Number no. 9 come out and not do well. Yeah. It's probably something that, given a little bit more time and care, could have been successful. And I think that this is a case of when you're making a game, you have to have this visual, this vision as your as a director, right? As an executive producer, director in all these places to know when releasing the game, just to make sure that you get as close to the release date that you originally planned as possible is not worth it. If the game is not going to be, uh, you know, you are now you're already past the date, right? Right. So every day past the date, it doesn't really matter at this point. As long as it was, as long as the game comes out and for the people that backed it, it was worth the wait, then it's generally going to be okay. Which is what I feel like is going to have similarities to this game. You think it's going to, you think it's going to be so pushed back because they knew that like, look, we've got to push it back to make sure the game meets expectations yeah. because mighty number no. nine got delayed again and again, and then just eventually came out to you know essentially terrible reviews and backlash from most of the people who backed it yeah and people liked curse so much especially for what it was i think you could beat it in less than an hour yeah it was very short um, but people liked that it. it was a very true to castlemania exactly experience. which is which is funny because uh i played it on switch and i played it twice now i think and i think here's two more times or one more time you have to do to unlock the last character but uh, it's funny because I actually called it Bloodlines. When I show, I'm like, wait a second, that sounds familiar. It's because it's a Castlevania game. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a, it's uh, the Sega Genesis one that I actually did not play. Oh, okay. But yeah, I think that it'll do fine depending on the price point. I, I'm pretty sure it's a twenty dollar price point. Um, well, and and even then, it I guess it's a bit of a shame that it's not hitting this year because this has been a big year for Metroidvania, and I think that it would have. I mean, obviously, who it is and what it's aiming to be is good for it. But I think if you also hit a year that's hyped around a lot of good Metroidvania games like Hollow Knight, and um, I still struggle as to whether I want to really call uh, Dead Cells a Metroidvania, but I think it leans more towards it than not. So I'm gonna stick with it being a Metroidvania. Uh, yeah, then you, of course. No, you it have, certainly does. Yeah, then you have Guacamelee two come out. Uh, it's been a big year for him, and there's uh, you, obviously you had games like Time Splitters or Time Spinners, not Splitters, um, come out that was also a fairly solid game. Uh, it's it's been an interesting year, and I think it probably would have been cool for it to hit it. But I guess if nothing else, what it did hit this year is at least getting that Curse of the Moon out. So you got a taste of what you're kind of looking for. Side game, cheap enough hold you over until the full game comes out. And I think that that's a cool, it's a good way to do it. And it was promised from backing. So we kind of knew it was going to happen. Uh, but that's also another thing, I guess, is that you're splitting development between two games, essentially, even if one was a smaller, probably easier product to pull off. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what we'll see sure. in, in a sense, not a bad sense. I'm curious as to what you think <clears throat> about this. Um, Cause I don't really know. I feel like everybody's being kind of vague about these things and not being like, we haven't heard enough movement from Sony on this, but executive producer for Anthem was asked about crossplay for the title on Twitter, to which he responded with a vague, quote, not at launch, end quote. That was it, leading many to believe it is in the pipeline eventually. What do you think? I feel like a lot of games have been saying this, crossplay is not going to be at launch, but then they don't specifically say, but we're working on it. They just a say smart move. not at launch. That's a smart move because down the road, if Sony wants to do crossplay with this game, 
then they and they have the uh, uh, technology and the capabilities of the game to open up it, uh, open up crossplay across the platforms. Sure. Then it works. But if they don't, then you can't go and say, "Oh, well, they said crossplay." I was like, "We said not at launch." So we, I'll give you that. It's kind of a close-ended que- or answer to this question that protects them, and then yet it, it can lead hope. But if it leads hope, it's your fault for doing so. It's your it's your it's your fault for getting your hopes up on a question that's so close-ended as that, or an answer that's so close-ended. And I think that's a smart you way. Open it. Technically, yeah. yeah okay, because it's very vague. It doesn't it give you an, a definitive yes or no. Uh, but what I think... Well, no, it technically gives you a definitive no at launch. But I think yeah. that that's where it just ends. True, true. So it, it does give you a definitive it's no It's not there. really open-ending uh, as an answer because they were very to the point in what they answered or, or in their answer. So I think that it is very... It's, it, I like this kind of answer because people can't say, oh, we all said crossplay eventually. Where's it at? They said, not at launch. That's what we That's said. That's all we said. That's all we said. Yeah, but I think it is obvious that it leads towards the easily interpretation or easily interpreted to be that at some point, and you're already seeing that. People are like, that is the I can't fault. believe it. That is the fault of the no, part people. <laughs> I will agree with you on that, uh, but I think that they obviously know that people are going to fall more towards that, and I think it's... People want something so bad they don't really care if it's unlikely. Yeah. It's kind of like... Or they, they don't think like, of the consequences. We've talked about Fallout 76 enough, but like Fallout 76 and uh, like... There was another... Uh, and this is actually a, a, another example on a whole different thing, but Fallout 76 said that there was there was only not going to be crossplay because of Sony. But because then of Sony, Sony. That was Bethesda. Looped it around. It was kind of this, you know... We talked about that for, their, for, for a reason that they said that. Yeah. So it's funny that that happened, but then, of course, you have things like this. And I guess, in my mind, this is why... I think that it's probably better to be more concise with your wording just so that you don't have the chance of having that one fan who's just ridiculous about it. And I guess that's probably my mind of like, I'm not saying the company's in the wrong for it at any standard, uh, but like Rockstar uh, in regards to Red Dead Redemption Online, which has recently started beta for certain people, depending on when you played the game versus when you bought it. Um, But in that game, they said very clearly ahead of time that, hey, this is a beta. Um, We might have to reset progress for the full launch but we're you know they're essentially that's that's where they left it with the implication that they might not have to right but where i kind of landed on it when i read that was like well it pulls a little bit of the incentive away to even want to fully dive into the game one way or the other because you're up in the air with the other over whether or not you should play a certain way because it's going to be for not and i think in my mind the, the most obvious answer as to why, and we talked about this with Ryan last night in the party, but the most obvious reason why, I don't think you were in yet, uh, is that if somebody finds a loophole or a glitch that lets them just make massive amounts of money that destroys an economy that people already don't think is a good economy in that game, people are complaining about the way that the economy works, I of course you have to reset it because you don't want everybody to have an unfair advantage when the game goes fully live. I mean, obviously people are going to have the advantage of having more money because they played the beta, but how exponential could be capped to an extent by, you know, well, it's, it's reasonable to make this much money in this amount of time. Is it all the gold bars in that anyways? Like do you have to pay real money to buy those. No, that's going to be coming, but not at launch. Are you sure? Hmm? Yeah. I read an article about it earlier. Uh, well, I'm talking about the, are you, so what you're saying is the ability to buy. You will have the ability to pay real money for gold, but it's not in the game at this point. So how do you get gold bars? You have to get them from in the game world, apparently. I, I I thought I read that the gold bars are only obtainable using real world money. Not from what I saw, but oh. then again, this could just be misinformation on both sides. Uh, but either way, it's one of those things where I get it, but I think that my mindset for that and, again, for the idea behind leaving it so open-ended, instead of just going no plans at... And that that's and that's a better way to go. Not at launch leaves a lot on the back end of life. But what is what's the rest of that? That's so right. short. Like it is but, a, it is a solid answer, and it's technically a full. Not at launch. That's it. Yeah. What are we talking about? It's in regards to that end of sentence, end of explanation. But it leaves so much open in on the back end when you could say there are no plans for crossplay at this time, which is essentially saying that we have no plans on it, but if it were to be a big request and Sony will let us do it, then we'll look into it. That's the implication there. The implication here is that not at launch, but we're actively looking into it. Now, again, that is actually on the person who's perceiving it that way, but it's easy to perceive it that way. Just like I think I think to an extent, Rockstar probably would have been better off just saying, 
process, a progress in the beta will just be reset. And then if they find a way to where they don't have to do that and that nobody finds any major glitches that then they go, turns out progress won't have to be reset. And then it kind of looks good to them. I always use this as an example of Roadhouse. Whenever we go to eat there, one of my favorite things they do is when you go in and be like, Hey, how long is it going to be? They'll say 15 to 20 minutes. But when then you sit down with your thing and you probably wait seven, yeah, five to seven minutes. Yeah, it's an overestimation. And it's this thing so that you go, hey, man, they were really on the ball. They got it quicker than they said. But they do that on purpose. They know that they're, of course they they, do. they're inflating those times so that you look good. And I think that that's – I guess you err on the side of caution. Just say, hey, we're going to reset progress. And then when you get close and go, hey, we don't have to reset progress, then you go – and then you, I guess you look like a good guy for it. It's like, man, they found a way to do it without resetting progress. That's awesome. And I think that they could probably do the same with that, right? Just say, hey, we're not, we're not messing with it now. But then later they go, turns out we're going to be able to do crossplay, guys. And then everybody just loves it. I mean, whatever. It's an interesting thing either way. But we will see how that ends up working out down the line. I don't, I'm always curious on those games because of PC. That's always what makes it weird. If you, if you opt into crossplay, crossplay with PC, how does that affect the competitive side? Is there competitive stuff in Anthem? Yes. Is there? Okay. Yeah. I don't remember there being anything said about that. And that's the thing about Destiny too, right? If you do it to where Destiny 2 has it crossplay between Xbox and PlayStation 4, then you're fine. No, neither of the consoles hit 60 frames per second. So it's going to be essentially across the board fine. You know, you just have the people... You could say that maybe the analog stick is better on one over the other, but it's not massive enough to create a real divide. The frame rate is, though. Well, on PC it will be, but yeah, on that's consoles, what I'm yeah, the on frame rate will be, be because the hardcore players, you know, granted there's going to be more obviously because when you're playing on PC, it's rare to find somebody playing on controller versus keyboard and mouse when sure. it comes to these kind of games. But people who are on console already are using keyboard and mouse if they're hardcore enough about it, buying those adapters. That's so, true. There's, I know, I know three people in her life that bought those. DZ, he's been had one, yeah. So that's one. I should have known. I'm curious about the other two, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, and, oh man. But what's actually funny, uh, now that I remembered this, he actually bought one not to use keyboard and mouse, but because there's a worker way so he can play his Xbox controller on oh, it. Oh yeah, I remember that. He has his Elite controller. Uh, on PlayStation. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't remember what those little adapters are called, but I, I've seen them before. Some of the Z, but it's stuff I forgot. Or X, I mean. Either way, we, as, as much as we said we're tired of talking about Fallout, this one just is worth mentioning. Uh, in an attempted response slash apology for the canvas bag controversy that Bethesda faced with its Fallout 76 Power Armor Edition, where it was advertised to include a canvas West Tech bag that, when it shipped, was instead nylon and night and day in terms of the quality, look, and feel. Uh, Bethesda have asked for buyers to contact Bethesda Support to show proof of purchase, where they will then assist in giving you 500 atoms, which is the equivalent of $5, by the way. Some have advised against seeking out the 500 atoms as it can be seen as a form of currency, thus voiding your right to sue them, acting as a legal loophole specifically in the U.S. for Bethesda in their favor. I don't know how true that is. I think it's that's, worth mentioning, and I do think it makes enough sense. any class action lawsuit. Because you took incentive to uh, fix the problem. Yes, so you've... you've Exactly. You, you've taken an incentive that does act as a form of currency to make up for the difference. Yes. I'm curious it's essentially how... like you, you, if you, somebody apologizes to you and they offer you something to apologize with and you take it, granted, you are accepting the apology by taking the said gift. Uh, Which is funny. It's very similar to that. You can easily do it without saying you're sorry. You just go, oh, hey. Well, they're, they're, you're basically st stating that you are fine with the product you got and then you are taking this gift as because you're having to seek this out. So mm -hmm. this is like, okay, well, yeah, I was wronged. So let me go to the support website, screen cap my receipt, and then throw it to them. This is this is compensation for me to fix this. Yeah, exactly. When in reality, you don't want to drop on that. I mean, granted, with a class action lawsuit, it, you're going to need thousands and thousands of people to return any kind of money back to you. But there is a chance that if this gets big enough, you could get a check that paid for the collector's edition. Yeah, and there's I only think... like three thousand, uh, th three thousand uh, signed members because uh, people who actually have the Clash's Edition number is not that great. So even when they sue, depending on what they sue for, to spend, you know, the amount they get back, it's not going to be a lot. Well, I don't know a lot about law, but I would imagine some of it comes into how likely you are to win and how vague this is a situation. And I think, oh no, this is this, this is, is clear cut, blatant. Yeah, yeah, clear cut false advertisement. Uh, which you know, just as a as a tie in to something that happened, Sony got caught up in a very similar thing, uh, specifically because of multiplayer only on Killzone Shadowfall because it was not true 1080p. Uh, it was 
interlaced somehow. Oh, that way. So it was 1920 by like, I can't remember what it was, but it was in an effort to make sure that the multiplayer was always at 60 frames per second. Someone sued them and, and got a big enough class action lawsuit together to where specifically because the multiplayer was not 1080p true and the back of the case says 1080p and doesn't di- different, uh, differentiate it even further, that that's kind of where it caught them. And they ended up having to pay out for that. Uh, and that was a That was a more in between case the other os lawsuit they had on their hands as well where they marketed the playstation 3 as a console that was available to be bought and installed with a linux operating system on the back side so that you could have an other os on the console and actually utilize that and when they found out that there was loopholes that were letting people get in and break the playstation 3's encryptions and stuff like that and essentially jailbreak or whatever you want to call it you know uh, going in and modding modding and whatnot the uh, exploiting the ps3 i guess would be the word to use um they ended up pulling that which was probably the smart move um, yeah but they ended up having to pay on that lawsuit as well because people bought the system so if as long as you bought it before the date that it was um pulled as an option on the console where in terms of it was pulled as an advertising point then you got money I got like, and it wasn't a lot. I think I got like twenty dollars in PSN credit or fifteen dollars in PSN credit for it. Which I mean, whatever. It's weird. They paid you in PSN credit for a class action lawsuit. Yep. Because you know the people in the Vita class action lawsuit got ten dollar check from them. And it's always different. I think with the, I think again with that other OS one, it was kind of a vague, weird thing. And it's more in between. I feel like this one's a little more cut and dry. You were obviously saying that it was going to be a canvas bag and nothing was made beforehand to make sure that people had time to cancel the purchase. Yeah. And, you know, I and, think all Bethesda probably would have needed to do. And again, we're not lawyers, but I think it, I think that they'd have a bigger leg to stand on if they just said uh, two weeks before the game came out, we put out a statement on Twitter once that said, Hey, for people who are looking at the power armor edition, we were not able to do the canvas bag. And that way people can make the decision as to whether to keep it and buy it or not. Or refund then it. the onus becomes on the person who bought it as to the fact that they got a bag differently than what they expected, because we put out a thing. It wasn't on us that they didn't see it or whatever, you know, kind of like you talked about with the, on GameStop where it's not GameStop's right. It's Bethesda by putting that statement out into the either and having the ability for people to see it can kind of remove themselves from responsibility in the case. Who knows? Well, it's, yeah. And, and it's very similar. I wonder if what you got the PSN credit was similar to the Adams here. If that was their like form of a settlement with you, this was law. Like the law did this. I mean, the court settled on this and I think it was that it didn't have to be money because it was essentially you're getting money back into the ecosystem that you're still getting a form of currency. Well, they didn't lose anything then. I mean, technically they did because they took the loss of whatever you bought. You know, they're essentially losing yeah. the back end they make percentage wise across these things. But see, yeah. And, and swallowing the whole purchase, essentially, because right. it falls on their shoulders. Uh, so for those that, that have the collector's edition with the uh, Power Tech, Power Tech, Vault Tech bag, uh, don't accept the 500 atoms as a form of a settlement because then you can't jump in on class action. And it, it's more to send a message. Like we don't want that. We, we yeah. don't want people to think that like you can give us five dollars in virtual currency. You literally made up on the spot that is not going to affect them in any kind of economical sense, period. <laughs> you like they, they literally create that number, the serial number to give you to get the 500 atoms and it doesn't affect them. And, and, and you can't even buy the bag in the game with that amount of credits. And what's really funny about the whole situation is that realistically, when you look at production costs, the five dollars that they're now having to spend, they probably could have easily just spent towards making the bag canvas to begin with. Well, and there's that. But then this thing is apparently in the stages, people. Are, I guess I don't remember the response exactly, but people are giving them hell because they're talking about the great canvas shortage of 2018, and they're like, apparently, apparently you weren't around during the canvas war of 1942. <laughs> And it's just, so people are saying that, of course, this was just that it was more expensive than they, and that's, the guy did say something about that. It was more expensive than they anticipated and they weren't able to get the material or something like that. The whole thing is just a, a goofball. And it's funny because it, not only did they have this class action lawsuit going or building against them, we don't, I mean, it's technically not active, I don't think yet, but this is also on the back of another class action lawsuit building for the knowing uh, and what would you call this it's, all you actually used the correct the one wording. it's the uh day now that you said that i don't remember but it's it's i'll have to look at it again but it's basically the um 
Selling a an incomplete, broken product with knowledge of it ahead of time. Yeah, it's pretty much that. It's they they made this game. They are aware that it is an, uh, unplayable to senses of with people having crashes and such, and that it is uh, not the complete final product that it should be. Um, and some things. This was another lawsuit though that happened not too long ago with another game. And it didn't work out. I so I'm curious about this one specifically. I'm curious too, but I think one thing that Saul talked about, one piece of slightly damning evidence for them to an extent. And again, that still kind of probably leads the onus to be back on the people who bought it anyway. But the statement that Bethesda put out prior to the game's uh, beta and then release, where they were saying that the game is probably going to be buggy and we're, we're working with you guys to... Uh, you know, essentially make the game what it should be. And I'm really curious that that's going to affect them. Uh, but I'm going to move on to the next thing. And much to everyone who was excited, including myself, uh, our chagrin, the path of exile, uh, Diablo like isometric dungeon crawler for those who do not know who it is, what it is, uh, that was originally announced to be making its way to PS4 later this year has now been delayed into February of 2019 as its current targeted release window. We will see if it hits that, but that's a little bit of a bummer. Good free to play game. If you haven't seen it, look into it and hopefully when it makes its way to PS4, if you do not have a PC or an Xbox to play it currently, you can do so on PS4 and have a good time. Uh, Devil May Cry 5 is getting a collector's edition in North America, which will include a copy of the game. Obviously, a, quote, premium case, end quote, which I assume is probably a steelbook. Um, a replica of the Devil May Cry van, which is actually kind of cool looking. pretty cool, yeah. Uh, an art book, obviously. A premium pen and I Love Osaka sticker. That's all in Japanese, which is pretty good. Um, it's a bumper sticker. And, uh, and an 11 by 17 cloth print, all for $120. Not bad. This launches with the normal game on March eighth, twenty nineteen. You know what's interesting? I just I didn't think about it, but it really weirded me out. And I think I mentioned it in Discord. Um, the Dark Siders Apocalypse Edition that I got, and I assume the Collector's Edition too, for people who got that one, uh, came with not only a steel book but also the normal game wrapped in its normal casing. So yeah, that is you did put that in Discord. Yeah, it was weird to me because I pulled the I pulled the steel book out first because it's first in the package, and I opened it up. I was like. Did they really not put the game in here? And I was mad for a second, and then I reached in, and I was like, oh, this That's, is the, also the sealed game. so weird. I assume, and I don't know why you would necessarily do this, but I assume that either you uh, you you like steel books, but you like to use them as show pieces, so you don't want to keep the game in it, but you want to let it be like a shelf piece, or... Once you beat the game and think that your time's done with it, if you want to sell it or trade it in or whatever, you still have the the steel book while having a viable option of a case to trade it in with. Yeah, that's that 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 second part's dumb to me. Why keep a game case for a game you don't own? I I know. I don't know. It's weird. It's a very it's, odd that, setup. That, that that just to me is clutter. I wouldn't do that. Well, you just got to think different people. And I mean, cause you could, I'm sure there's people that would look at this wall back here and be like, this is all clutter. It's organized clutter. It is organized. I, I guess I'll organized, give it that. But it is, but my, it is my definition of clutter, but I've had a weird mindset change lately where like I have pop figures and I have this stuff in the, in the game room at home and I'm going to redo that. And I'm like, I got to get rid of half that. Cause it's like, I don't know. It just takes up space and it's, I mean, it looks nice and stuff on some of it, but at the same time, it's like I'm slowly moving away from that kind of part of my life of collecting things. Like, there are things, though, like the Dark Souls 2 Collector's Edition, the Destiny 2 Collector's Edition, stuff that I really hold value to because it's emotional value, but there's also pop figures and stuff that I bought on a whim, and it's just kind of like, well, and they, they fall you. down half the time that they're up, so they always look bad. Um, there's so. that. My yeah. secret Santa may be receiving a box full of pop figures as their Christmas present with some other things. I already, yeah, but my secret Santa is going to get some good stuff for our Discord secret Santa. That's closed, by the way, so you missed that if you are if you wanted to do that. <laughs> yeah, but if you want to be in for next year and have all the cool fun with our little community in there, then join the Discord like we always talk about. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. I can actually see that. I know that I have a lot of clutter, and I'm trying to fight that side of me that wants to buy all this stupid stuff to look at. I don't know why. It's a really... I look at things all the time, and like as much as I love the Apocalypse Edition collection that I bought, and the uh, statues look great. I mean, they really do. Um, my number one thing is I looked at them, and I was like, you know, price per statue. If I there's four statues, if I divide that by four, I've paid around the same pi price for the statue of one of those statues, if not actually a little bit less, as I did for the Spider-Man Collector's Edition with its statue. And the Spider-Man Collector's Edition statue actually looks worse. 
Yeah, well, and uh, it's a little smaller too. Yeah, and it's smaller in scale. Those are very large. That they was are. another thing that they look. They're very big and they look very highly detailed. And then I look at Spider Man. I'm like, it's short and not very detailed. And definitely in comparison, to like my uh, Batman that's over here behind your chair, that like you can see every fiber in his suit. And yeah. that's from back in Arkham City, 2011. Eight. No, wait, never mind. I'm thinking of Ark- I'm thinking of what was the first one? Arkham Asylum. Arkham Asylum, yeah. Yeah. That was I think it was 09. But regardless, yeah, it's just yeah, one 09. of those things where uh, I, I guess my value is there in terms of comparison to other things that I've gotten. Uh, but as somebody who's trying to also actively pay his car off and is getting very close, that four hundred dollars honestly would have been more useful elsewhere in my life in terms of a more responsible purchase. Now that does not mean that I don't buy dumb stuff. I buy dumb stuff every day. I could eat at home. You could easily justify anything. I could eat at home and not go eat. We just went to Wendy's like 30 minutes before the podcast. Exactly. So, And we didn't have to do that. We could have ate some crappy food at home and saved a lot of money and put that money towards something I don't practical. know what kind of food you cook at home. Mine's not crappy. In comparison, it feels crappy. That's not, that's a problem I have, but that's a we'll get into that. Yeah, that's a, that is a problem I am not have. a chef. That's why. I will say that. <laughs> I'm not a chef. <laughs> Let's and I also up. like restaurant environments, but let's wrap up the news. Moving that on, uh, Kiki, this will be important for you and other people who are tired of seeing too much Kingdom Hearts 3 or do not want to get spoiled of too much. Uh, for those wanting to see more of Kingdom Hearts 3 or avoid it, like I said, Tetsuya Nomura has shared a schedule of new trailers and footage that posts the next video coming on December 10th with a final trailer for the game hitting December 18th. And then lastly, December 21st, we'll have a 30 second commercial that will be hitting movie theaters. So you'll see it in there. Uh, the game launches January 29th for us in the North America and Europe territories. So I'm glad do what you got to do. Watch what you want to watch. And if you don't want to watch it, steer clear, avoid it. I think Kiki's probably good. He muted a lot of keywords like my boy Ryan did with God of war. Um, one more thing before we move into essentially our last, um, you know, main topic and, you know, we do the reader mail before that PS plus games for December have been announced and headlining the list is sci-fi horror title Soma for the PS4 followed by X drive club teams, uh, code master release. So they did on rush and that team is sadly no longer. The list is rounded off by Steradin for PS3 Steins gate for PS3. Iconoclast for PS Vita and PS4 cross by, which actually was a pretty, it released either late last year or early this year and was quite talked about game. So I'm excited to try it out. Yeah, I'm going to download that on Vita. And then lastly, Papers, Please for PS Vita. If y'all recall, we were getting very close to, I think it was March, if I recall. Uh, March of 2019 is the last month that they will have PS3 and PS Vita games on the PS Plus. So I'm still curious as how that's going to work and how they're going to fill that gap. If it's going to be better PS4 games, but less or somewhere in between where instead of getting six games, we get three PS4 games of all higher quality of our higher. I won't say higher quality. That implies that some of the games we've gotten have not been high quality, but I think of newer, more in the mainstream and news cycle and also generally would cost you more somewhere in that ballpark of that. And a generally a general consensus of higher quality versus better value uh, across three games and or four games instead of six and how they're going to pull that off. And if they're going to fill that, maybe still you get two PS PS four games and then you get a PS VR game and the two PS four games are always, you know, That'd games that have come out within the year. That'll be worth it. I'm curious. I don't want to say it's not worth it at all. Cause I've played a lot of PS plus games. That I ended up loving that. I wouldn't have tried on my own accord. And yeah. it's, you gotta you gotta balance that off to some extent. But before we move into our final topic, we're gonna hit some reader mail. And I think uh, Saul, do you have any reader mail on your side? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah I got. Two I thought questions. you did. I just was making sure. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the Facebook question while you're doing that. Sure. So for those that don't know, reader mail is a weekly segment on our podcast where we answer y'all's questions that you uh, ask us on Twitter and on Facebook on Wednesdays and Fridays. You should see a tweet or a post come up asking uh, you guys to ask us stuff, and we'll uh, do it on the air. If you don't hear it on the air, don't fret, don't frown. We have Reader Mail episode for the first Friday of every month, uh, except last month. That was like the third Friday. But anyways, (laughs) uh, technical difficulties aside, our first question is... From our good buddy, Sean, he says, what makes a good boss battle? And I like the picture he put in uh, Twitter because it was a picture of Psycho Mantis from Metal Gear Solid. So that, uh, you know, honestly, you're not going to touch boss battles when they come when it comes to Metal Gear Solid. Those are they're also unique and just intriguing. 
that they are there. It's, it's its own animal. So I, I actually, whenever I first read this question, decided to do hard mode and not include any examples from Metal Gear Solid uh, per se. So I like it when a, a dungeon or an area before the boss leading up, there are mechanics that are very minor mechanics, whether it's traversing through the area or weapon play that you have to do to get through the area that comes in at the boss battle at the end. I like that a lot. I love that. Yeah. Me- mechanical reinforcement is what I essentially right. call that. When you see the mechanics out in the open, in the or not in the open world, but in the world that you're playing, the dungeon leading up to it, all that, the game builds this mechanic slowly throughout it just for it to come to a climax at the boss. I love that. Um, it, it, it well rounds out any kind of area in a game that it does that with. And yeah. that, I mean, honestly, it's hard to beat that. It's hard to beat that one instance there because you can say, oh, new uh, abilities or mechanics pop up in the boss, but you got to learn. That's fine, uh, but I'll, I'll throw a wild card in there that doesn't happen often. Well, I want to kind of expand on that real quick before we move too far away from it. One thing I also like is that when they do that with a boss, and then they kind of pull the mechanic back and you don't see it a lot anymore, just for them to be at the final boss of the game. And it incorporates all, all the, the mechanics, mechanics from each yeah. boss back into this one. That's what The made games it. that can really pull that off, God of War, the newest one being one of those uh, where all the mechanics in the game came to where you used every mechanic in the game at that final boss fight. Uh, and I really thought that was cool. And I liked that. It, it wasn't necessarily a crazy boss fight, but it felt so mechanically good that you didn't care. Yeah. So. And, and you, you know, Ocarina of Time, almost all Zelda games do that, but Ocarina of Time specifically through Ganon's castle at the end, incorporating a room that was each temple was pretty cool. I like games that do that a lot. I like I, when it comes all right around town. I see. I would agree that most Zelda games do that. I don't remember feeling that same feeling in in the three of the four divine beasts that I took down in my time with Breath of the Wild. I don't. Yeah, they give you. They give. I mean, they they, they give you a new ability to use, and you have to use that ability to get to get through the. But they, they don't feel like they were as heavily leaned on. Now this is this is a long removed, and that's why I'm saying I don't feel like I remember it. I'm not, feel, I'm not going to say that I for sure don't. Like it didn't happen, yeah. but I don't recall it. It happens as strongly as in other Zelda games. It happens a lot in Ganon's castle at the end. And it's that might really be cool. why and I didn't um, get there. Because I'd say that, you know, I think the other thing about memories is obviously your reverence for a game will affect how well you do or don't remember it. Um, so since that game just didn't really ever click with me as much as it did everyone else, I, I didn't even want to beat it. It essentially got to the point where I remember some parts, like I remember the water one and you having to drain the water and pull the water back up and, and uh the i remember parts of it the ganon blights were actually pretty difficult in my opinion on the first go around um but yeah I, I like games that do that and there's a rare occasion that it happens in which you are fighting a boss and the boss has random rhythm mechanics oh man and those are great well you know what's funny that's actually i would argue that what made older, like that kind of in between area from like the 90s into 2000 and maybe even a little into the 2000s, because uh, you saw it with games like the end of uh, Dragon Guard 1, uh, is entirely rhythm based. It was very odd um, that they, they pulled it out. And this is where the true ending that leads into Nier. Very cool that they did that. Um, but th- you saw that in a lot of games. Uh, and I saw it with Knack as well. The end of the first Knack game, for all the flaws that that game had, its final boss was very challenging because it was very rhythmic in how it did things, and it's learning these patterns. And I think that if I had to say anything, that's what makes good boss fights to me, and that's part of why I love platforming games so much is because mechanically they tend to be more simple. They try and make the boss fights memorable and challenging by having you really remember these patterns that they're going to do, and you learn their attacks, and you learn how to manipulate maneuver throughout there back and forth so that you can get to them and what's funny is a lot of those uh, uh, those, a lot of those boss fights crash bandicoot being one of them you only normally have to get one hit in and then you reset the process and then there's then there's new uh sets of of motions where you got to figure out what this is now and i think that while you're not doing as much moment to moment like you see in like dark siders or dark souls uh dark siders 3 specifically where you're having to do very on the cusp like okay well i know he's going to do this so i have to dodge this way those are fun and there's a lot that i like about the way that dark souls as a series handles boss fights because they're just genuinely challenging along with patterns and you have to kind of look for what they're going to do and look for tales Uh, but i'd also say that i like when they make boss fights like that doesn't have to be that way i like when boss fights are easy in terms of the 
getting to them and doing damage to them part, but getting to them is the hard part. Like they try and make the boss fight more engaging by making getting to the boss hard. Yeah. And then when you incorporate the little itty, like the tiny instances of that into the boss battle just rounds it all out for yeah. me. Uh, Kiki wants to know, how did y'all meet? How did the podcast idea come up? We met, uh, I was a sophomore, no, junior in high school. Yeah. Technically. Yeah. Uh, so you were in my Spanish class, but you were also friends with my younger brother, who is also your age, so two years younger than me. And... Brett would come over uh, to our stepdad's house and spend the night on some weekends, and we would all play Unreal Tournament 3, I think, was it? Was, yep, was it Unreal three? Tournament 3. Uh, we'd all uh, sit up and play that and Resistance uh, in my brother's room. Resistance 2, yes, we did do a lot of that. Yeah, and it pretty much stayed on to that where um, after school, like we got to where we would go to like your house out in the country for like those weekend meetups almost and play Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon and stuff like that. And then it kind of just continued through that. Um, and in one of those weird twists of life where I love Seth, but it's like my friendship with Seth really morphed into like the more I saw Saul and, and going there, it's like my friendship with Saul kind of reinforced why I kind of got further from Seth. Uh, and that wasn't anything just particularly on purpose. It's just funny how life does that to you sometimes. There, There's a new, uh, there's a meme that fits this really well where it's like the two Indian guys and they're standing and it's like no longer friends with what's his name and then for now friends with and they're like have their hands crossed and they have just the paint X's on them. It is hilarious. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to say I'm not friends with Seth. I talk to Seth all the time. It's just we're not as close as no, me and you are now and that's, that's a funny thing, you know? It is. Um, it would only be more funny if Trace, my brother, and Seth ended up being best friends somehow in this mix-up, that would have been the weirdest thing in the world. It is, especially since I was really good friends with... Uh, uh, Trace. With your... Yeah, Brett's the, brother. Yeah, early on here in those right years. Here. It's very interesting. Uh, it's, oh, my God. you never seen this before? <laughs> nope. Friendship ended Obi-Wan. Now Palpatine is my best friend. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Um, but, yeah, I think that's pretty interesting. I mean... That how that ended up swinging around, but yeah, me and Saul just uh, after the Yu Gi Oh nights at my house out in the country, it's been over six, seven years ago. Um, and we were already decent friends by then because I'd come over to your house sometimes too, yeah. Um, because me and my brother shared an apartment, yeah. So we would just kind of all hang out, uh, but then from there, we kind of got to the point where it was more us hanging out on our own, hanging out with us, yeah. So it kind of evolved from that, yeah. And so the the podcast kind of came. Uh, and I think we've probably answered this before earlier on, but it, we, pro we, I assume just looking at numbers that we have a lot of new listeners who may have missed it or didn't go back and hear it. Uh, the podcast idea essentially came from me and saw kind of me saw and blaze actually. And we talk about blaze all the time in here. You've seen him. If you've gone back older episodes, uh, or if you saw our PSX thing last year, then you've seen blaze or party um, place. He's our party, every place. party plays we've done. The idea behind it originally was that we always would get together, and since we all three loved gaming, we would always get together and inadvertently end up talking about gaming, and and we're all a bunch of opinionated people. So of course we just sit here and start sh you know spreading our opinion to each other, and excuse me, working toward it or working you know through them, and we we got to this point where we're like, why don't we just do this? on the internet anyway and just record ourselves doing it and try and be a little more professional about the way we go about doing it uh which set up in actually 2015 uh, is when we originally planned to do this uh but then of course my wife was pregnant or <laughs> my then not wife but my girlfriend of a long time was pregnant and um my daughter was about to be born and it, becoming a father really slowed it down and stopped our ability to have an extra room to be able to do it in. And everybody's schedules kind of got crazy. Saul started working a lot more and we didn't get to hang out for a little bit of a stint. And Blaze kind of got to the point where we weren't getting... So essentially life happened. And Bla Blaze got pregnant. Yeah, and Blaze... <laughs> yeah, Blaze got pregnant. <laughs> uh, but so all that kind of slowed us down. And then we kind of started talking about it again whenever uh, PS I Love You was coming to a close because we were like, man, it's going to suck not having a PlayStation podcast around anymore. And by that point in time, Saul had kind of converted back to PlayStation pretty hardcore. I'll say, for, And we talked that, about it a yeah, lot. I'll say the, the first time we talked about... Um, the first time we talked about it, I was mainly Xbox. Actually, technically, we all had an Xbox, but I did not have a PlayStation. Uh, Brett had an Xbox One and a PlayStation 4. I think Blaze only had a PC, right? 
Yeah. Well, he had an Xbox One too. That's right. He was playing Destiny with, with us. us. Yeah. So, but he had he, a PS3. Yeah. So it's kind of like a weird. Well, I had a between. PS3 then. Yeah. Then, then at that point too, but uh, we were gonna have it to where I was gonna be the Xbox guy, Blaze was gonna be the PC guy, and now and Brett would be the PlayStation guy. But that kind of de-evolved that over the course of 2015. Uh, Through 2017 when we started. Yeah, like I, I pretty much hopped on the... These plans were also made before we even made the channel too. The, yeah. These plans dated back before 2015. But by the time we made the channel and it all, like we were coming up with ideas for it, well, I was already hardcore in a PlayStation. Uh, Blaze got a PlayStation 4 by then, I believe. Uh, I didn't even have an Xbox anymore. And... Uh, Brett was still pretty much on PlayStation, and we wanted to fill that that void of a podcast that was PlayStation based. And we both had a, a, a at that point. Then we both had a, a you know a, a common interest again to where we could just come together and do a show that was less open gaming. And I'm not neither of us are against the idea of going towards a more open gaming uh, discussion podcast. And we've talked about it as we get more time and more resources that we may start going towards something that is equivalent to that, but we don't know. We're not committing to anything like that. Um, but it made sense for us to not only fill a void left over because we didn't feel like there was necessarily a ton of great PlayStation podcast. It was something we were passionate about. Definitely. I mean, I can only speak for myself. I felt like Saul was passionate about it, and I knew that I was passionate about PlayStation course, to an extent yeah. that if I was going to start it, it made most sense to start it in that area. Uh, and then past that, you know, it was just a, a passion for, I think, you know, it's, it's been really interesting. I think that, you know, we saw what can happen, like we always talk about. We saw that you can build something, uh, you can build a community online, and it doesn't, it, it's so odd what a community like that can be because you think it was just a bunch of people that have found us talking over the internet, but it becomes so much more so quickly. Like when we have people join the discord and now these are people that we know by name and we talk to frequently pretty much every day. And thanks for saying out. I have your addresses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to put out that little creepy. I sent so we many don't have things your addresses. out where I'm just like, these people now have my address. They could technically kill me if they wanted to. Yeah. So um, just subscribe to Patreon if you're a <laughs> if you're a creeper. So it, I don't know. It's been interesting, but I think that you know we knew that there would be a community aspect, but we didn't know it was going to be as fun as it was. And so it's just been really fun to keep going with it. Uh, but that's a good question, Kiki. Thank yeah, you, good, sir. Thank you, sir. Our last question is going to come from Facebook, and I actually think this one is really fun. Um, I think. I know that it stemmed from my Apocalypse Edition purchase, but I think it's a curious thing because I'm actually curious of what your answer is. I feel like I may know it, but I don't quite know. So Donovan asks, what is the most money you have spent on a video game, cumulatively, all expansion or collector's items included? Now, when I originally did this, and I'm, I'm going to let you determine how we want to go about this, I took collector's items to mean collector's editions, but I guess collector's items is an open enough thing to include figurines and stuff like that. Um, how do you want to do it? Do you want to cap it off on how much you spent? Like, so if I would it's just say any amount cost of the game. So like, uh, subscriptions, subscription costs well, I, would play into it. If you bought collectors editions for the game, stuff like that. Or do you want to have it be literally everything collectible and all? I would be collective of it all. Basically, anytime you bought a single title, uh, or any amount of money you spent toward a single title, including figures, including everything. for the tiger for yeah. for the title. So like, as long as it's pra- packaged with the title. Oh yeah. See, no, I agree there. But we, what we were talking about is differentiating between like a pop. No, that does not count. I agree. Okay. So okay, that's that's our that's our point where we're gonna start. Obviously, my four hundred dollar Dark Side Three Apocalypse Edition is high. Now, do we not want to put a subscription cost into it? Because that is if we do, the title. I'll say if we do, Final Fantasy fourteen is mine. I felt like that's what I thought your answer was. I was subscribed be. for almost two years, and at fifteen dollars a year, that a month. I mean, a month. My bad. Yeah. That's roughly. What is that? 45. That's a lot of money. 180 <laughs> times two. Right? Yeah. So I think 360. So 360. So $360 plus the game, which was 40. So we're at $400 plus uh, Stormblood, which was $40 plus. Um, uh, so you're at, two, you're at 440 right Reborn. Now. Hold on. Then there, what, what am I missing here? Is it just a Realm Reborn and. Stormblood? I no. feel like I feel like it is. Is there one more now? I don't know. <clears throat> but obviously, like I said, the four hundred dollars is quite high for there. Uh, if we're gonna go off of 
specifically. I think if I had to do one purchase like that, it probably is the Dark Siders that I just did. Uh, if I had to go more with counting in subscriptions, it's going to be RuneScape. Um, I have played RuneScape. Ooh. And I always play on membership up until this most recent time because you had to restart. So there's no real incentive to be on membership yet. Um, but I've played RuneScape for about eight years of my life. Probably. I, I feel like that's pretty solid, if not even a little bit more than that. And membership per month was seven ninety nine for the longest. So seven ninety nine a month for eight years is up there. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it is. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that's probably where I'm at. And I think that's the most likely to be my, uh, let's see, seven ninety nine. Yeah, we suck at math, by the way. Yeah. I hate math. You said eight years? Mm-hmm. Cannot divide it by zero. I don't know what what I just did on the calculator. Seven hundred and sixty seven dollars. So yeah. And that that's... price changed a little bit. It went from seven ninety nine to eight ninety nine and now it's at ten ninety nine. Uh which is actually reasonable considering how much MMOs tend to cost. Most of them are fifteen dollars a month, so they're still doing very well in that if, regard. If so, you don't count a subscription fee though, Grand Theft Auto five. Not shark cards and like that, but I've bought it like five times ago. <laughs> Then The Witcher 3 is up in that money too, boy. How many times you bought The Witcher 3 now? Four? I bought three. Three? Yeah. Still pretty. And, and I got I got a, like the second time I got it was a $20 sale one. Oh, okay. So you got and, you got deals. Well, I got, yeah, the first one I bought it for 40 on sale. The second time I bought it for 20 on sale. The recent time I bought it was 20 on sale, but it was the digital version I did not buy before that had everything. Was the, okay. Was the game of the year edition or whatever? The what, what I forgot what so, it's called. So I guess it's going to be, if we're not counting subscriptions, Darksiders uh, Apocalypse Edition uh, for Darksiders 3, and then if not, then RuneScape, and then you're stuck, you're okay with Final Fantasy 14? Yeah, yeah, Final Fantasy 14 by, by far. Good ones. All right, we want to hear what you spent the most money on, and I hope one of y'all just shames me. I can't, unless one of y'all bought like that Mazda, I think it was a Miata, uh, <laughs> Gran Turismo Sport Collector's Editions they had where you got the car with the Gran Turismo labeling and all that. Like an actual car? Yeah, that was like $30,000 oh and it goodness. came with a PS4. Um, the game, obviously, a car. So you're essentially just buying a car at that point. You're just getting a bunch of stuff for free. I think it came with a TV as well. Y'all say dealership incentives. Yeah. <laughs> so unless you got one of those, I'm curious to see how much above us you could be from a single purchase. Uh, unless you're one of those people who's been playing World of Warcraft every month, never laps your subscription since it launched in 2003, I would assume. Yeah. Because then that's some lot. money. $15 a month for... Especially 12, the one guy who plays 30 at Council Month. 14 years. Do you know oh, about God. that? No, what? 40 yeah, dude, accounts a month? Dude has like 30 or 40 accounts, and he has multiple gaming setups in his house. He plays all of them. He raids with himself. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to even get into that. They did mindset. the math where it was like $12,000 either a month or a year. I'm pretty sure it's a month. First of all, what does this man do? I want to assume he collects money from the government because I don't think you have time to raid with yourself on a World of Warcraft at any given point. Then like, how do you have the money to pay for the subscriptions? Because I don't, I mean, I don't think the government gives you that much money. I'm going to assume there is illegal activities involved in his rating. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that he's going to get raided one day by the FBI. <laughs> then he'll really be raiding by himself. Oh, man. Okay. Well, we are going to move into the main topic here. And because it was a slow news week and, and uh, I'm sick of talking about Bethesda and Todd Howard's lies, <laughs> it just works. Which sucks because, like, one of my best friends, uh, he was telling me that, like, uh, one of his stepbrothers, or not stepbrothers, um, would be brother in law uh, if this worked. But uh, he works for Bethesda and he worked off Fallout 76, and he can't really talk much about it. But he's like, the office is tense right now. I it's think I same, know who this friend yeah, is. Same guy who worked on Doom. Yep. Well, so, you know what? I got to say, it's. Um, and they're we're, we're tired about of it. talking about it. So we're going to stop yeah. talking about it instead. What we're going to talk about is Mr. Jeff Keighley uh, has announced that over 10 games are set to be announced during the 2018 Game Awards. Speaking of Game Awards, real quick plug, go to Twitter and or Facebook. I will retweet them one more time. I didn't get on it as much this week as I should have. I apologize for that. We are doing our community Game of uh, the Year awards or Game Awards in general. And of course, we're going to have a Game of the Year segment 
our category, but we also want to do our own categories like we did last year, uh, where we see whether you want to do a uh, best new protagonist or best new IP or whatever you want. And whatever you think is a good category, uh, we're going to tally how many times they get mentioned or how something, how many times something close gets mentioned. Uh, and if we get it, if it gets mentioned a couple of times, or if we think it's a good one, we'll go ahead and pull it in and we'll create our category list. And then from there, we are going to have all of you respond with your answer for each category and we will tally the responses and we will have our community answer for what our game awards are. So find any way you can, if you are interested at all, I have that, um, list over on Facebook, like I said, and on Twitter, I will retweet on Twitter and I'll find a way to repost it on Facebook so we can get a little bit more answers. Um, and then get this popping off so we can see what the game awards are going to be for us this year. But we have 10 games and 10 plus games potentially uh, unannounced unannounced they're going to be first time announced here and it's going to be interesting me and Saul thought what a, what a weird time for this right this is off the heels of PlayStation saying that they don't have enough to justify um, or at least where they're at they don't have and not enough ready to show to justify not only PSX for this year but also E3 for next year so with that on the heels me and Saul actually have a little bit of a disagreement about this. I think that people would be up in arms at least moderately if Sony were to announce something during the Game Awards. Uh, and I mean something as in a new announcement. Now, he's saying that these are 10 games to be announced. I'm not saying Dreams getting a beta date or Dreams getting a, a release date in a trailer. A full-fledged game. I'm talking about a full-fledged uh, announcement from start to finish uh, that, of something we've never seen before. I think if Sony were to show something in that capacity at the Game Awards, um, people would be a little bit up in arms. But Saul seems to be on the other side yeah. of that. So give us, oh, give well, us I mean, your hot take. It's simple. They, they say they reveal two games. They're not going to pay money for a booth at E3 to reveal two games. So it doesn't make sense for it to be to be mad if they reveal two games. Um, now I could see, without it having relation to E3, maybe they would be mad that it's not PSX because you know people expect things to be uh, announced at PSX. But I also think that it will work out better that way because you will then get possibly either a release date or you will get a trailer too. So, now, do you mean later on when it comes back through, or do you mean specifically a release date during the well, Game Awards? No, during PSX. Next year, I assume, right? No, this <clears> year. There is no PSX there this year. There is no PSX this year. What am I? Well, yeah, I went off there. Uh, I'm full I'm full of Wendy's. i got a belly full of Wendy's. <laughs> you yeah, got, you're you, right. You got the Wendy's so, itis. So, yeah, that makes it even more, uh, makes even more sense in my mind, because... If if they're gonna release say two games, let's let's say a brand new Jack and Daxter game. This is just an example, but a brand okay, new Jack right. and Daxter. Yeah, we'll roll with it. Go ahead. They're not gonna have an E three showcase for one game. So to be mad at it being a reveal for one game, even two, even three, I don't see I disagree with three. I don't think one you and could, two, I'm with you. I think a forty five minute conference with I around three games. Because we'll think about it. If you're running three games, sure. It's filled with Excuse me. Games we already know about. Yeah. They'll yeah, have to be already. interspersed, of yeah. course. So it's going to be games like Death Stranding if it's not out yet. So like I think that they canceled E3 like in a very smart manner because they do know that if they do need to announce something, it's not going to have a hurrah that it's going to have that that would make in sense E3 or justified yeah, to be at an E3. I think that, as a matter of fact, that having a game announced at the Game Awards would be a, almost as a saving grace because it's like, well, we don't get PSX, but we did get this. And that's going to make the Game Awards a much more... I said the same thing with PAX like two episodes ago. This stuff being released, people paying to get their games in these spots on the show, it's going to make Game Awards much more of a bigger monster. And I think that's good. I think that then we... we you know, Game Awards is already huge, but for the awards itself, last year was one of the first times that Game Awards came around with actual big announcements. Uh, I think 2016 was the year they started that. Am I right? Um, kind of. With because, the announcements. And you got to think about the history of the Game Awards. I think that's important to talk about in here because the Game Awards are literally just the evolution of Jeff moving off on his own once Spike stopped airing the Spike right. game of g- it's, Game it's Awards. Him taking the initiative on it and, and, um, and pulling his own pulling his reins into it. So, of course, in the history of the Game Awards, as it is just for him, 
um, then yeah, they kind of took a step back from uh, announcing a lot of stuff. Because I don't know if you remember, The Last of Us was originally announced during the Spike Game Awards in uh, 2012, 2011. Or something like that. 2011, 2012, one of the two. Um, but essentially, you know, you saw that go down. Uh, at the Game Awards for Spike. So that kind of makes sense that they had a history before of announcing and showing big games. Well, you're not seeing it. But then that slowed down. Yeah, 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 you're not seeing it in the caliber that we saw last year. Last year was massive. Last year, I'm pretty sure they revealed more games at Game Awards than Microsoft and Sony unveiled in their Sony E3 press conferences. Huh, I'm brand, trying to remember a brand, lot of them. Brand I mean, I remember games. some of them, but regardless, I mean, I'll give you that. They've definitely grown in capacity there. I actually disagree that I think it being growing like that is as good of a thing. I think that the show is growing too big as to move too far away from what I'd want to see. They spend way too much time and effort with the uh, the, the, the side acts and uh, having little concerts that I don't. No, yeah, now that kind of that that, that to me is conference it, filler. It's, it's bloat, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it really it's, is bloat, and I think that if they can do it in a way where they have a nice because I will say this, I'm a fan of having a nice stage, a nice show, uh, and, and making your presentation good. But that does not mean that you have to bloat everything that there is in it, uh, because those are very they're very visually oriented. Um, so they kind of sometimes go overboard and trying to make their trying to make that presentation step so much above that you're going away from what's honestly a good and like finding the line and not crossing it. And going, this is a good, clean. It's it's it looks good high quality presentation, but we also get to the core of what this is about. And I say that because the game awards go on for so long. They're like two hours long, aren't they? Yes. And I, even, I don't mind that though. I think last year they were like two and a half hours. I do think, well, but when it's filled with so much bloat in that particular sense, I stopped caring. Like keep, they kept going to the shit guy last year of uh, the, sh- the shit quattro, which at the first time they showed it was funny of like him being a mortal Kombat character. It was like, okay, this is all right. It's a small break. Yeah. I will say that there's, there's filler in this conference that could cut it down by like probably a good hour. So that's what I'm saying. I guess and my, my worry is that the more that you feed into it, the more bloat it will continue to add as it kind of, because E3 got bloated and then you're yeah. seeing E3 kind of get trimmed down now, not by nature of their own thing, but by nature of allowing the public in because they have to make it better for the public. Uh, you know, before it wasn't set up for the public. Uh, so when they come in and then the public go to do it, the public were not necessarily impressed with the way it was handled. So they're having to try and get better to make sure that they're making the money that they can make off of the public coming in, which helps keep the show stay. It keeps the uh, E3 afloat as a conference Co- every year. Yeah. But of course, you know, now they have Sony and people pulling off as well. So they having to do more to try and step up and make up for the difference, which should lead them to being a little more leaner and cleaner and probably better overall. Um, hopefully. Now, well, of yeah, course, we'll see there, this there's also sure. on, onus on the manufacturers. Regardless of what E3 is, you can't control what the manufacturers are doing. They have their conference, and that's up to them. But they can do stuff to try and make it better. Uh, but essentially, I don't know how I feel about that completely. But for now, while we wait to see what happens with the Game Awards, which I think are coming up, is it the... December four- 6th. Is it 6th? Yep, Thursday, okay, December 6th. So this coming Thursday, uh, this will go live Monday on the 3rd, and then we'll have... Um, uh, the conference to look for on the six. We were going to plan like possibly streaming this together, but I, I can't get off work that night. So I'm just going to go home and probably hop in discord and get, uh, actually, no, I probably won't hop in discord. Cause I kind of want to keep everything secret until I watch it. So I'll probably, I probably, I could see that. Yeah. So I wish, I really wish it was Friday the next day. Um, but yeah, so I, I'll probably hop in Discord when I'm done watching it and see what everybody thinks. So probably be around midnight our time, but I'm, I'm curious because, this to me, I like conferences almost almost any kind. So this to me is always exciting. Well, because they're like they're like our Super Bowl and Rolls Bowl. Yeah, and, like and all of these big moments, like the major leagues and the major the the lackluster feeling we got from Sony E3. Now with no PSX, this is kind of what is going to tide us over until the foreseeable future, right? Because we don't we're not getting Sony E3 next year. So they, and we it, say that specifically from the PlayStation side. from a PlayStation side, of course. Yeah. Now there's, there's there's arguments to be made about E3 that we'll get into, but go ahead and finish your point. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just saying that I, I like that this is showing up to be. Uh, to to announce games because I, I like that we're not going to get something like that uh, until next June. So well, and if you think about it, like we saw this year, uh, Sony pulled away after E3 from his game from Gamescom and Paris Games Week, and uh, my and Microsoft wasn't big at either of those events either. So we really saw after E3 
for the most part, it was very backed up. I mean, Sony had a presence, and even if it was inadvertently from third-party support that ended up being exclusive, uh, like that uh, Judgment game that's coming from the Yakuza creator. Uh, but when you have moments like that, of course, TGS had some moments that were very Sony oriented. So Sony was there in presence regardless. Right. Uh, and I will make that that's the argument for E3 for next year as well. Sony doesn't have to be there to still have a presence in an exclusive nature like we saw with uh, Nier and that uh, front mission game that our spinoff series that they're doing that I can't remember the name of my my for my, the life of me right now left alive or something like that. Um, I think that is I think that is it, isn't it? Left Alive, something like that. But uh, my my point being is that Sony already has enough third party exclusive support, or at least console exclusive support, that they don't have to be there to still have a presence. And then, of course, the argument that I saw last year, which don't get me wrong, this is not taking away from the fact that Microsoft still had a good presentation and a very solid conference last year at E3. But by nature of them not being very exclusive heavy, most of what they shown. Was, most of what they had shown was also available on PlayStation. So again, PlayStation is getting its time because these games are still going to come on PlayStation and all you're doing is just seeing them on the opposing competition. Now there is of course the long running thing where there are people who see the competition. God. <laughs> there are people who see the competition and getting the, the games and go, oh, that game is exclusive now. Uh, there's always that subset of any fandom, so gaming as a hobby, who see that, and then that's kind of all they're going off of. All they're having to go off of is, we see Xbox in, uh, you know, alongside this, so in our mind, Xbox is it's exclusive with Xbox. Now, PlayStation reaps those same benefits. Uh, there are people that thought Red Dead 2 was going to be Xbox, I mean, going to be PlayStation exclusive. Yeah, that's... Um, no. So it just goes to show Come there's a group now. of those people. But, yeah, Sony doesn't have to be at the conference to be the, to to be there. I think at this point in this console generation, and Sony kind of doesn't have here. to be there, period. Yeah. They're already going to be there no matter what. Exactly, with, and that's with, what with, you're kind of saying with the Game Awards, though, right? Is that Sony doesn't have to be there themselves necessarily to announce something themselves yeah. or, or to get something announced. Or you to even feel that presence of like, okay, I am, you know, I'm comforted by seeing this uh, announcement because it's by this company and this company and it's being published by them. And I know that's going to be a good game. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes up that, that almost wholesome excitement you get from watching E3 uh, during Sony's conference or, or, even, or just, even the console conferences in general yeah the 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 console manufacturer you prefer you know everybody feels that way with halo i still get like you know chill bumps with halo uh trailer plays or something Even when they showed the halo infinite you were like oh yeah <laughs> yeah like i still get chill bumps whenever i see stuff like that and, and there was barely anything shown so it, but it's, it just gets to you it, a, it does yeah that's part of being a fan it, yeah it's the crazy thing about uh being a fan of video games and a fan of just about anything in general um but it's something I'm I, I, I'm very excited. There's not even, I don't think in my mind, a reason to be cautious because with Jeff saying 10 games, that's a lot of games. It is. That that's and, and with having, you know, we both have PCs and Xbox or, or PlayStation, so we're covered for the most part. And I have a, and Switch, you have a Switch. And so I'm sure you'll have a Switch covered. by the end of next year, depending on what comes out. So we will see. I'm, cu I'm curious as to like what we're going to get because I'm kind of set no matter what. I have all the consoles I need in a way. Um, unless it's like an Xbox exclusive that oh whatever mind they already said all Xbox exclusives launch on on um, Games absolutely Pass, so yep. on on PC and Games Pass uh, so I mean from here what we're going to kind of talk about is what do we think these ten games are going to be and from who and I think that that's going to be I, interesting. I, yeah I'm not going to be I'm not going to say anything I don't know I literally do not know an answer to, to what these ten games could be they're unannounced we don't know of anything that I would foresee being revealed. Like, go ahead and give me some things that I'm about. about. One, one thing that I think might be revealed, and this is due to the way Obsidian is doing things right now. So Obsidian have been going on their website and posting pictures um, of like, they're very, what's funny is they're very Fallout-esque looking. Did you see what I'm talking I know, about? No, I've not seen them. <clears throat> I can go to their website real quick. Uh, yeah, so Obsidian on, on their computer, website but. have got these essentially, they're very Bioshock slash Fallout, where it's like this 50s, 60s style marketing Um where you see like uh, that's it right there. You see that yellow picture? Those, oh, that's yeah, one like of them. 50s style. Yeah, it's, it's very it's very different in the way that they're going off these things. So what it ends up leaving you with they and they and they've posted a bunch of them. They posted like five or six of them, uh, and they're all like weird products that look like they're meant to be from a game world. And my my feeling is that the reason that they've been updating their site this past week to two weeks with it is that they're slowly leaking more and more little things to get hype built up so that they're going to announce something on the Game Awards stage. Now, this is important. Right now, uh, 
Obsidian obviously is owned by Microsoft. We've learned about that at the XO uh, 18 uh, event. Now, prior to Microsoft buying them, it, we have learned that Obsidian already had a deal in the works with 2K to publish a game. And Microsoft, when buying it, said that they would honor that deal and let it go ahead and go through. So we're going Ooh. to get a multi-plat Obsidian game, which looks very reminiscent to, to Fallout slash Bioshock stuff, right? It does. Uh, and maybe even a little bit of something like Rage or something like that. I don't know. It's very odd the way you're looking at it. It's just... It's got a very specific style, and I feel like we're leading towards them announcing something because, think about it this way. Obsidian worked on Fallout New Vegas, uh, but that was because of specifically where <sighs> Bethesda was as a publisher and developer at the time. Now that we've had a confirmation happen from Bethesda saying that... Uh, now we've had confirmation from Bethesda saying that there's not going to be uh, a situation where another developer gets to make a Fallout game again. So that pretty much puts the shoe, you know, in the closet. <laughs> My new saying as I just came up with. Um, yeah, I was or, say, I've never heard that saying before. <laughs> uh, anyway, it makes it to where we pretty much know that the sun is set on the ability for uh, Obsidian to come back and make another game, which was highly requested. A lot of people wanted that. So wouldn't it make sense for Obsidian to make a deal with 2K to publish a game that feels very much like what Obsidian did with the Fallout franchise, but in their own world and new setup? And that would for be it dope. to look like that, I feel like that's what they're leading towards. That's, I, that's probably one of the announcements. And I think that this is the oh, right stage for Well, it. for sure. There was a countdown that led to what the day of the Game Awards is. Exactly. On so so they yeah. are. So it definitely is going to be something with that but it, in terms of anything else like i don't know like i really there, now there's a fine line too between games and dlcs D does he actually mean standalone games or does he mean that he uh dlcs can be included in these 10 well and, and can they be standalone dlc because i think that that would count to an extent by a technicality um so like they did with uh wolfenstein the old blood you didn't have to yeah. have wolfenstein and to second play son it. um, um Second Son. Yeah, oh, First Light. First Light. I could, yes. Yeah. Yeah. First Light, you could play completely independently from the original game. Right. Um, and when you look at situations like that, since they don't require the base game to play, I think it's fair enough to technically consider them games, but I don't think it's fair enough to say... They're, they are new games because they are going to be completely playable without having to have the uh, previous game. Yeah. You but know what I mean? I always feel like... I feel like that should never technically be allowed again like i said it's by a technicality but i kind of get it i get it too i just said i don't like it um and then it also depends like because even on those i think you could to an extent consider them spinoffs i think that first light for example from second son is removed enough from the main game that it's essentially just a spinoff it's just another reason to have a, another infamous title that you can that's shorter in, in stature and, and scale um and you know with the power set obviously you're just playing as fetch in that game so you have just a Neon powers, but it's a. I hate that name so much. Oh, what fetch? Yeah, that's a uh, terrible character name. Well, anyway, look, saw you ruining the table. I'm ruining the set. Anyway, uh, another game that did that though, um, and God, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping out on it for some reason. Um, all right. Anyway, my point being is that you can do that essentially free from the game, and it just acts as a, what a, what. It acts as a spinoff, essentially. No, I know, but that's, um, that's what I don't like about and it. And Uncharted Lost Legacy was where I was going to go with it. That was supposed to be DLC. They ended up getting to a point where they are like, well, let's just make it an independent game. And it has nothing really... Yeah. It, has, it has tangential ties. I guess what I'm trying to say, though, is that if they announce standalones based off of other games we've seen before as an out, as, as new announcements, I'm going to be mad. What if you? So what if it's a spinoff, though? That's what I mean. Like, so If it's a spinoff, like a genuine spinoff that's a $60 game that's a full-fledged game, then but yeah. It's still a but not a two-and-a-half-hour, three-hour standalone DLC that's $15. I, okay. I hate that for some Fair reason. Fair enough. Uh, but so, I don't know what it would be. So if I recall... Spider-Man, perhaps? Uh, was it? Maybe, maybe, but... When you think about it like this, um, I don't. I feel like they're probably done with Spider Man because we know we get the last of the the city that never sleeps DLC, yeah. and then they've kind of made it clear that they're going to move on after that, which I think is fair. Destiny three, um, Dark Souls ooh. four, Fable three or four. Now you know what? Another thing we might actually see, and it would be a, a boon for Microsoft actually, would be if they finally come forward with that studio that they were hiring to. What we heard. Uh, I can't remember if it was Play Dead or who the developer was. I think it was one of the fours of developers extended to another team that were going to work on rebooting uh, or making a, a fantasy RPG that a lot of people thought was a reboot of Fable. Um, oh, yeah, that would be. Dope. I think it would be a really good thing for Microsoft after the year they've had of not a lot of exclusives, 
versus, and, I, and again, not to take away from what Xbox has done, because I think it's fair enough to say that Forza did really well for them. Uh, and despite oh, yeah. Sea of Thieves underperforming in pretty much every aspect. Fun game. Real still fun a fun game. game. And I think that people who like Xbox have got something out of that game, despite it. But when you go in against a year that has uh, Spider-Man and Detroit and God of War. Detroit and, was better than Spider-Man. <laughs> In a way, I think I might agree with you. I don't honestly know. But my point being is that we've had a year of PlayStation exclusives um, that are up there and vying for Game of the Year. Spider-Man and God of War are both constantly in conversations with people about being Game God of the of Year, War even too? if I don't agree with it. No, God. We're not I, like, I like how I'm sticking in my own like little bubble of just recommending games as we're talking about other things. <laughs> like, it'll be like three and none episodes. of them are possible because you know God of War 2 and Horizon 2 are both going to be PlayStation 5. Well, like th- it'll be funny because like three episodes from now, I'll say Gravity Rush 3. And you're like, Saul, we already know what they are. It was revealed two weeks ago. <laughs> if you kept that up, I wouldn't even be mad. <laughs> I'd just roll with it. Uh, but I'm, I don't know. Because, okay, last year. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I think I might be. Did they reveal a way out at EA's? Yeah, and then we three, saw. I don't. I don't remember that at all. I do know for a fact it was at Game Awards. I do know for a fact Sekiro. It was there. Sekiro was revealed at Game Awards. And see, how would you that's, feel about that? That's that's the thing, though. That's what I like about this. That's why I don't like really speculating on this because it was such a left field reveal. That's what I hope we'll I'll get more of this year. But okay, then we'll, we'll pull it back from a game to game basis. But how do you feel about that being one of the 10 games where you don't even learn what it is? All oh, it is is a short cryptic thing with I a developer. I love name. it. I love that. For those that do not know, one of my favorite things in the world is like Easter egg hunting or like trying to hunt down what this is when there's a secret involved in a game. And that was a fun hunt. People were literally deciphering frame by frame with the artwork to decide like what this was. Now everybody and was wrong. Everybody was wrong. No one guessed it right. Dead wrong. But that's the that's the fun of the hunt. That's, that's true. The, that's that's what made it so fun. Is what everybody was speculating. They were like, they they literally took the bone in his arm and was like, huh? Are those engravings? And like people were zooming in and trying to enhance and Photoshop the picture and like cover it with filters and layers so you could see hidden messages. And it was all for nothing. But it's fun to follow. <laughs> it's like the whole Kojima PT is Death Stranding thing. It's fun to follow. Yeah, I think you've honestly. I think for a little bit you were really like. I think that it, I, is well, it. it makes it made so much sense. And then I think as they've continued to show more of it, you're like, I uh, I think you're just there and like the. Make sure my, my tinfoil still in my hat. Yeah, it's still there. <laughs> but I think they're not gonna get this mind. You've landed in the. If it happens now, I just get to say that I told I was you so. Ad- I was an early adopter. <laughs> but I don't truly believe it at this point. Yeah. Um, and I think that, yeah, I'll give you that. There's something fun to that. And I think that if, okay, I don't want an entire conference of that because it takes away from it. When you splice something like that in with a more traditional announcement, and it's like even when you don't do any kind of in-between. Bye, computer. <laughs> Rip. Uh, anyway, when you don't do any kind of an in-between announcement either and nobody comes out on stage and you just start with this little, like, dude, the Sekiro one was perfect. It was. It was just it was creepy. Just, it it, it started it, out quiet and then you were, it, it was. You hear a little. And then, Well, you saw From Software and you were like, oh, what is this? And then all of a sudden you heard that creak and that was it. And you're just like, and what was that? And then it said that? shadows die twice. Yeah. And you're and like. You're just, people were thinking like Bloodborne and, all, or, uh, and Demon Souls and all kinds of stuff. And dude. You're talking about the the hunt. One of my favorite things is that people were digging so far back. Like, it's going to be a Kingsfield 2. Yeah. It's like, they haven't made a Kingsfield game since PS1. Yeah, like Do you really think that they're going to pull out Kingsfield? Which, don't get me wrong, if they would have, also would have been amazing. Just to, everybody's over here talking about Bloodborne. Because, you know, the one person who said Kingsfield 2 would be like, I told y'all. <laughs> He'll be the one in the back wearing musty clothes. <laughs> oh, my God. That was mean. Oh, that was mean. Um. I mean, I could see the points for that, but I I think that I don't want to get my head too big because I think while we say 10 games is a lot of games, I feel like half of them, I'm going to go as bold as I say half of them. I feel like five of them are going to be somewhere between uh, cool double A release, like cool double A games that are announcements that are not necessarily huge, which is reasonable. And I think that those fit really well or indie. So it's going to be somewhere in that. Yeah. So five of the games I'd say right now, I'm going to say half and half. You're going to have like two or three indies, the two or three double A games games. that are a little bit smaller in scale, but are really cool and doing something interesting. Big bombers, triple A titles from big studios. And of those five, you may have three of them that are very definitive and that are, and then you you may have an exclusive and then you may have one that's real cryptic again. Yeah. And I mean, I think, I think 90% of the new reveals are going to be multi-plats anyways. I think so too. Definitely. We know Obsidian is going to be multi-plat. Um, if if this course. is the 2K game, which it makes no sense that it wouldn't be the 2K game. There's no way that they have, they're ready to show anything from Even Microsoft. though they're being published by 2K, could that still be a timed exclusive? 
I don't think so okay. uh, unless Microsoft does something to help fund the game or f- fund marketing. Or they, they, there's a way. There's I always think, a yeah. way. Uh, but I think that essentially there was a contract in hand and Microsoft literally just said, we're leaving the contract as is. Because you got to think about it. As long as the game sell, sells well, uh, and they own Obsidian, so whatever money Obsidian gets, you know, if it, if it reviews well, it kind of just ties back into things. I mean, I guess that by nature, owning Obsidian wouldn't necessarily mean that it's going to be monetarily good for uh, Microsoft. But I will, what I will say is that if the game is good enough and sells well and reviews well to get Obsidian's name even bigger, then that bodes well for when Microsoft is ready to show their Obsidian game. Yeah. Because then Obsidian has even more positive word of mouth around it. Yeah, they uh, have the funds as well that came in from the game. So they give them resources and funding too. Well, and I mean, I, I guess, but at the same time, I think that if it goes off that way, from what we normally know about the way publishing works, um, the the funding of the game is already more or less done, right? That was already handled. 2K said, here's oh, yeah, how much money we're going to give you. And if you need extension, you have to ask us for it and then we'll either approve it or deny it. Um, and then from there, if they get more money is based off of whether whatever whatever goals they set and if they hit. So if the goal was to, if you hit it at least an 85 on Metacritic, then we're going to give you another million dollars. That's more of like bonuses out to the studio. I don't necessarily think that's directly to Microsoft or anything. Microsoft has money. From what we've been seeing, Microsoft is walking around to their studio saying, what's a dream game you've always wanted to make? And you know, the response that you heard was that people were like, well, what's our budget? And they said, don't worry about budget. We're Microsoft. We have money. You tell us what game you want to make. And I think that what they're trying to do there is that they've seen Sony do this with with success. Uh, Sony let Naughty Dog just move on with The Last of Us. The Last of Us was a crazy idea that just happened from Bruce and Neil watching something together and just moving forward with it. And Sony kind of uninhibitedly just let them go, hey, make your product and we're going to stand behind it. We know that y'all are talented developers. And regardless of how y'all feel about uh, The Last of Us, and I know plenty of people don't enjoy it, but it was also a massive, massive success for Sony. Horizon was another case of Sony backing off and going... You know, somebody at Gorilla going, hey, I want to make this game that's so different from anything you've ever seen from us, and we don't have the people to do it just yet, and we're going to have to hire in certain people to make this game right. And instead of Sony questioning a bunch of what they said, instead Sony was just like, we believe in you, do it. Yeah. And you know what? Even if it was just set up to where Sony does that once, there's a lot to be said in a games company removing their hand from the pile and just say, we're going to give you money as much as we can justify and as best as possible. You tell us what you want to make and how much you think it's going to cost and we're, and we're going to roll through with it and we'll give you this one and if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. Uh, and, you know, we've seen Sony be very good about that. I think if Microsoft is trying to take a step in that direction, then that's awesome. But in this particular case, I don't think that the money would necessarily go back over to Microsoft. So instead, Microsoft is just going to say, here's money. Don't worry about what you made from this other game. That's just for y'all. Yeah. And that would be and great. I had the fans on the side of the game. Uh, but Obsidian. that's what's good. Yeah. Is there, and then you... Because I forgot that you basically get money from the publisher and then you end up you paying make that the game back. Yeah. yeah with from the that. sales. Yeah. So they give you the money up front and then they keep whatever money happens from the sales. That's essentially what happens. Yeah. They go, hey, with, we're going to need this much money. With cuts being made to the employees of the developers. And yeah. Stuff of course. And then it's going to come down to, and if you hit this, we'll give you uh, incentive bonuses yeah. for doing even better job than what we intended. So I think in that sense, you know, there's a lot to be said that they could gain from Obsidian making this multi-plat. Uh, I think EA is probably going to have something. But do you remember, and I'm trying really hard to remember, and I know you were ugh because you didn't like uh, Miss Renee being on stage, but Vincent Campanella... Um, oh, yeah, the Star Wars game. How long did he say it was out? Because he said we're still about a year out from talking about it. And that was at Is that what he said? E3, something like that. Because that makes me think that we probably won't see that until It could be E3. Smoke and Mirrors, though. But we also could get a teaser for it here yeah. to be shown technically, in though, full. Technically, though, the game's not... Fully announced. Well, we know a name. So it, technically it is fully announced. But we've not seen anything on the game. So I would say that if they tease that, then that's fair. That's a, that's, a, that's fair That's game. an announcement. I would, be, I would be, it depends on what kind of game. Because like, there have been rumors about a Star Wars RTS game coming back into the limelight. I don't and think that, that would be the Titanfall team. If I had to say, uh, if you're looking at Respawn and what they're known for and what Vincent's known for, I think that they're going to go off of somebody who has Republic a handle Commando around... Team first person games. Yeah. Now what I would really think would be interesting to show from something like that. And if they do show it, and this would be very cool to me is to take somebody like Vince who knows how to make a great first person shooter 
and then make him adapt to a first person game that's not necessarily shooting. I, I don't want lightsabers in first person. No, no, no. I don't mean lightsabers either. I just mean in general, what's it going to be? Is it going to be crossbows? Potentially. I mean, it could be a number of things. My ideal thing when I think about games like that, that I think are so interesting in the way they approach first person because of the flexibility involved with it is something like Dishonored where you pull in and there's so many ways that you can play it and put something like that in a world that people already love and there's already reverence for and put a spin on it in a way and also give it to somebody who knows how to make amazing first person shooters and I don't I mean I think it's really hard to argue that Titanfall 2's campaign whether or not the story was great it was super super fun and it felt amazing and I mean I think that the, the story was okay and it's a fun campaign uh, very memorable so in that sense I think if you take somebody who has the creative mind to do great first person shooters like that and then you try and not and I, I would hope that he'd do it to himself, right? He would go, I'm going to take my first person and I'm still going to make a first person game because that's what people know from me and what people want from me, but I'm going to change up the way I view it and how I envision it. And you know, what he did with Titanfall was let's, let's run on walls. You know, let's change up the way that you move around the map. What if at this time he goes, let's take that even further. Now we're going to take the way you move around the map, expand that to even further. But we're also going to change the way that you shoot. And if it's shooting or if it's going to be hand-to-hand combat occasionally, whether we'll give you both options, you know. And I think that upping it like that would be really cool. And it'd be even more interesting if it was somebody who was force sensitive in the game but didn't have a lightsaber yet and instead you're getting to use some force powers very lightly to aid you in fun ways it would be really cool if it was a darth bane game oh darth bane is one of the coolest yeah. star wars characters for those that don't know man literally created a force explosion with his mind called the mind bomb oh but knowing what it was and i can't remember the name so please, I, I, but it sounded very much like it's going to be more in the line of something that's aiming towards the military complex of the Star Wars universe. Right, which is very similar to Republic Commando. Yeah. so I, I'm, You even had squad commands in that game. I'm curious how this is going to work out. But I think that's one that we might see, even if it's just like we say, a teaser that just shows a quick like running or something of the, of the in, a game in engine footage real quick, and it just says Star Wars, and it has the name pop up underneath it, and that was it. That'd be cool, and I'd actually be kind of psyched for that because I psyched stoked for that uh, I, I like too. I like Star Wars and I mean I think that they've done well in video games before and they can do well in video games again yeah um, and for those that uh, speak out of uh, Darth Bane if you do like the books like I would recommend checking out any of the books if you are curious about the lore of Star Wars and the uh, even though expanded they, universe they're all not canon yeah yeah they're not canon anymore nah. but they have reached to the books for there's a lot of inspiration on what they're they, moving into yeah, canon now. Yeah, it's kind of a BS situation. They they made some really good stories non-canon, and then they took sto- elements that made those stories good and put them in the movies. And I was like, oh, that's not canon, but this part is. This part we're going to use for this movie. So, yeah, I've seen that. But, well, I don't know. I don't think that there's any other games that just necessarily come to mind or any other studios that immediately come to mind that I feel like they've been sitting on something for a long time. Yeah, uh, that's what I was thinking. Of. Like, it's, it's hard to think of like... Now, these are new announcements. Do you think there's anything that is... And you can finish that but do you think there's anything that's just updates outside of these 10 no. that we also see or do you think they're going to focus primarily on entirely new things if that, possible yeah they were, they're going to focus on entirely new things if possible that's what i would prefer to see at least that's why i can you imagine them being so big that they have the 10 plus new things and updates though that's kind of what i'm getting at. i mean if it's two hours and these trailers are 30 45 seconds a piece possible yeah it's still possible okay but uh why don't you guys let us know what y'all want to see Fair enough. can you uh can you go ahead and uh, predict 10 games? Because I can't. I mean, I, I can't predict either. two at most. So, and I don't want to because I really want to be surprised. So, like, anything you predicted, and if I see him, like, he spoiled it. He <laughs> unintentionally spoiled it for me. Okay, look, I want to stretch it a little further. No. If you want to predict 10 games, oh, okay. that's fine. But what I want to see, I'm curious if there's developers that we did not think of and come up that haven't been seen in a long time that makes sense to come up out of the blue now and actually have a game that you think of that we know that they might be working on or something along the lines. Because like before From Software, we knew they were working on something new, but no one knew what it was. So seeing it was like, what in the hell is it going to be? And I wonder if we're going to see another situation like that. And if there's a, a notable developer that has been sitting on something for a while or the even more weird situation of notable developers stretching into new teams to also come out with something. And what you think those things might or might not be. Yeah. Um, I think that'd that, be real fun. Let's get that new Star Wars game. Yeah, get that. All the good Star Wars. Bring back Star Wars 1313. Uh, but with all that said, I think this has been the end of episode 88 for Triangle Squared. So until next week, 
This has been Triangle Square. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks to our patrons, Chad V, Dan Barber, Josh Jarrell, Mikey12, My Name is Dan, Douglas Blow, Sean Santarude, Shadowist, Stephen Salazar, The Stonard, Travis Blow, Blake Post, Eduardo Palomino. If you would like to support us, the link is in the description below. We appreciate it. Thank you.